For my presentation for the Manchester leg of the Connect project, I talked about a broken system, a broken system that I believe we can fix. So we often talk about the environmental impact of um, fast fashion and the fashion industry in general in a very negative way in terms of the fact we examine um, the environmental impact, the impact it has on ethics and workers and things like that. And we rarely talk about the ways that we could actually fix it at the moment. So what I want to do in this presentation is begin with talking about the system that I feel is broken and then try and finish on a positive, which is the ways that I believe that we will fix it. So I'll start with UK fashion consumption. Um, this is an installation from um, MS's launch of their swapping initiative, um, which was to do with bringing your end of life clothing back to the store to regain some of the value from that um, whilst purchasing new ones so that MS can recycle it under their Plan A initiative. And the clothing that's shown on all the walls here in this installation represents 9,500 odd pieces of clothing and that constitutes five minutes of the clothing waste that we generate in the UK so that's what we throw away every five minutes. Um, in, interestingly um, as well as America the UK leans very heavily on an importation model for clothing so around about 68-70% of our clothes all come from outside of our borders or are made outside of our borders and bought in and what that has meant is that since 2000 we've lost 52% of the um, jobs in the UK related to textiles. So it's having a, a real effect on our economy um, as well as the speed at which we consume our clothing. The carbon footprint of the industry is 38 million tonnes of CO2 a year and for an average household, which I've kind of put up here, um, that constitutes 1.5 tonnes of CO2 per household and there are 26 million households in the UK. And uh, what that is equivalent to, if that doesn't hit home too easily, is driving a car constantly for three days non-stop or leaving your television on for an entire year. In terms of water consumption, which is big for fashion because of the way that cotton is produced, we've just visited Niagara Falls on this project, which was really exciting and interesting to see. The UK consumes about 6,500 million cubic metres of water um, associated with textile production and consumption. And that's the same amount of water that falls over these falls in six minutes. And that's quite a long time if you think about it, and given the fact that so much water falls over Niagara Falls every second. So um, if that doesn't really um, connect very well with you, then for, in terms of UK consumption, um, if we look at filling up your bath to the brim three times a day for an entire year, that constitutes the household um, consumption of water for cotton, because we know that cotton uses between 10,000 and 20,000 litres of water per kilogram produced. Um, so this is the Aral Sea, it's located in Uzbekistan and it's um, a water supply that's been used very heavily for cotton production um, and a lot of its tributaries, its supply tributaries have been diverted for irrigation for those crops and you can see the effect that our demand for cotton has had since 1997, uh, 1977 um, up until June 2013. So we've almost consumed an entire sea's worth of water um, through our demand for cotton and cheap production of cotton. And this is what it looks like on the ground as well. In terms of waste at the end of the life cycle, the UK is not too bad. We um, throw away about 1.8 million tonnes of useful textiles every year. Um, around about 80% of that um, is reused in some way. Even if it goes to incineration, it is um, used to produce, that incineration is used to produce energy. So there's quite a lot of on offsets to do with this waste, but we still um, throw away 20% of our textiles that all go to landfill, all of which are recycl recyclable. About 95% of everything we throw away is recyclable. And uh, the big issue with cotton is that when we throw it away, it becomes uh, organic matter, it starts to rot. 
And that rotting process produces methane, and methane is 72 times more harmful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide itself. So I'm interested in what we can do to counter um, these issues. And one of the things that I think we need to address is how we've designed social, social and personal institutions. And um, institutions are socially accepted ways of doing things. And quite a lot of the inst institutions that we live with these days have been designed and designed by businesses. So if you've ever felt like a rat trapped in a lab when you've been walking around a supermarket, that is because you are. That is a designed system designed to maximise our consumption and purchasing of food. And similarly, um, fashion is no better in terms of the way that companies have designed convenient um, and easy to use consumption systems that encourage us to buy a lot of stuff, um, to buy it cheaply and consume it quickly and value it very little. And uh, associated with that, as with food, in fact, is um, poor quality. Um, and that poor quality not only impacts on the environment through its mass consumption, but it also impacts very heavily on our health. And these institutions have trained us to act in a certain way. Um, and companies uh, build or structure their entire um, business models around these institutions. So we can see that fast fashion, which has been around for about 20 years now, um, generated a lot of new behaviours for firms, um, a lot of new um, investment and design of systems and supply chains to create fashion very, very quickly, very cheaply and at, you know, generally low quality. Um, but it obviously generates mass consumption, which produces quite high profits. Um, and that the installation of that system has trained us to behave um, differently. So to demand fashion very quickly, to buy it at low cost and expect to buy it at low cost and to do that very regularly. Um, and the result of that is that we need to throw more and more things out or create more wardrobe space in order to accommodate our enormous level of consumption um, for these cheap commodities. So it does create um, new jobs, new products and services, but we know that that has um, quite a large impact. And um, interestingly, just like um, any model or, or institution, social institution, they come in and out of existence. And um, this can be likened to teaching an old dog new tricks. So um, fast fashion is 20 years old. Um, and essentially the business model there for that is now old things in old ways. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Now, what often happens with uh, businesses, particularly ones that get to um, the stage of dominating markets, is that they get very used to doing things their way. So a bit like an old dog, um, they're very difficult to retrain, to redevelop, and that's because they sink costs into the systems that they have designed. So Zara and H&M have got an awful lot of investment invested in this fast fashion model. And what that means is that they defend that market. So any new entries, any new ways of doing things, what they tend to do is use their powerful market um, domination in order to, to kick out anything that might um, start to threaten the way that they do things. So it's a little bit like asking your mum or, uh, or dad to kind of use a brand new iPhone when they've never done it before. Uh, they tend to reject it because it's something that they're unaware of and doesn't fit into their habits. So I think the stage we're at now is actually in the green kind of circle here, which is we're starting to consider how we can take these old systems and develop them in new ways towards sustainability. And we're halfway towards um, big market disruption or mass market disruption where we start to do new things in new ways. And indeed, the hallmarks of this is that there are new entrepreneurial firms, small firms doing new things in new ways, but at the moment they've not got to the stage where they can start to threaten or seriously threaten the old dogs in the market. So we call the businesses that are heavily invested in things like fast fashion incumbent firms and that's because they have great difficulty in changing and you can see it happening with the car industry you can see it happening with various other industries where um, 
they're defending that market, preventing other entrepreneurial firms from growing. Um, and at some point, the disruption will get to the extent where firms die. So we see that um, like Kodak uh, died because it couldn't uh, keep up with the new digital market that it in fact created because it was incumbent based on um, the purchasing of film. Um, we've seen H&M and uh, companies like Jessup die based on the disruption from internet models of consumption. Um, and I think we're starting to see actually companies like Amazon um, struggle plainly because they've just got too big. So we've been trained by these institutions to think that the introduction of Louis Vuitton or of Harvey Nichols in our streets in Manchester is um, the arrival or the hallmarks of su the success of the city. But I would beg to differ about what these companies uh, do to our city. So this is one of the main streets in Manchester. And um, I dislike the architecture that's been created. It's cheap, it's functional, it's all about that consumption. And actually, while I was taking these pictures, um, a lot of the brands on that street came out to say, why are you taking pictures here? Um, so I thought I was standing in a public street. Apparently, the guys in Hugo Boss um, felt otherwise. Um, so I was getting their brand in the background. So one of the assistants came out and told me that I couldn't take photos here. Um, I asked why. Um, they didn't know. They just said it was company policy. Um, and then the manager came out and said the same thing. And it boiled down to the fact that he didn't know either um, why I wasn't allowed to take photos in that particular street. Well, what I'm interested in here is how our city has been designed to encourage our consumption. So you can see on our approach to Harvey Nichols here, there are very few places to sit down and hang around. It's all about the flow towards the business, towards doing that consumption. And if we look at the uh, market area, whilst we can sit down, it's all about um, keeping you moving and making sure that the people that aren't involved in this consumption system aren't hanging around. So here we are with um, a rather uncomfortable seating area that you can have a little break in for a few minutes, but you certainly can't lie down if you're a homeless person, and you certainly can't do some grinding or have a bit of fun if you're a skateboarder or a cyclist in the city. So it, what this is designed to do is attract a certain type of person and keep them moving. And we can even see our no skateboarding or cycling allowed in this area. Um, why is that? Why is that? So if we look at um, the way that retail has affected Manchester, sometimes it's had a little bit of a positive. So this is Cannon Street, or was Cannon Street, which is now part of the Arndale Shopping Centre in Manchester. Um, and this is what it looked like before that. So, you know, perhaps a little bit of a brutalist um, atrocity. Um, but let's have a look at um, how um, it's affected Manchester in negative ways. So one of the things is that I'm interested in ownership. So here we are with Starbucks beautifully designed to show you that you may not sit down or use any of these comfortable looking facilities unless you are buying coffee. Um, and here's another wonderful example of this idea. So this is the Piccadilly Gardens af after its regeneration. And you can see that it's very much designed with consumer flow towards um, shopping and consumption in mind. It's again, we can't rest, we can't hang around. Um, it's it's uh, designed to keep us moving. And this is what it looked like before that, um, which was rather beautiful. And here are some other images of that. It looks like a slightly typical grey Manchester day. Um, so obviously, here's some of the design features now that stop us from hanging around, that stop us from playing, that stop us from owning our city. Um, it's more heavily owned by the brands that it is now designed around. And it's also heavily surveilled. So we've got a lot of cameras kicking around that keep an eye on what we're doing and where we're going um, and make sure that we're not skateboarding or cycling or anything like that. or, or um, forming you know a community in any way um and if that doesn't kind of hit home about how brands have redesigned our city for us perhaps this will so this is primark um in manchester you can see it's installed in this uh, beautiful 
kind of uh, gothic building, um, classic piece of Manchester architecture, and that's the interior. Um, but the third or fourth floor looks like this. And um, you can actually see the dome, the beautiful dome that's inside this building on uh, Google Maps just here. Um, so you can see if we look at the Market Street stop there, you can just see um, the dome on the top. So I'm very interested in the fact that these institutions have not only shaped our lives and the way we behave, but they've also shaped our city. And I thought it was our city, not the realm or owned by brands. So I would ask you the question, who even owns our city? Is it the brands or is it us? And I thought public space was about us. So and indeed it can be. So here's some examples or an example of the sort of design that might mean that we gather and discuss and um, focus on uh, meeting our families and friends in cities and making them, taking back, them back as community spaces rather than those that are owned by brands. So this system or this institution was designed, and I'm going to let you read this quote for a minute by a chap called Victor Lebeau, who was one of the American economists evolved in designing this institution or this consumption system. And what I'd like to particularly highlight is the, the stuff in uh, orange and blue. So these commodities and services must be offered to the consumer with special urgency. We need things consumed, burned up, worn out, replaced and discarded at an ever increasing pace. And we also need constantly more expensive consumption. So, um, it's very interesting to see that this system was designed and the what I would argue therefore is that we can redesign these institutions um, to be much more sustainable and much more environmentally friendly, much more considerate of the things that are important to us like our health, um, like uh, meeting our friends and family and having time to do so and those are the things that make us happy. So mainstream economics has been about unlimited economic growth that is both possible and desirable. And I would argue very strongly against the fact that continuous growth is possible and desirable. Um, that was in 1971, where we believed that most of the resources that we had at the time were inexhaustible. And obviously now we know that they are finite. And we also thought that the growth of all commodities and the sale of those as fast as possible was very important to creating wealth. And whilst this has improved our quality of life, um, it's getting to the stage where it's gone a little bit ridiculous, and I'll show you why in a second. So it's also based on competition, which means ridiculous amounts of choice. Um, so let's look at a, a design for a second. We want to design something that reduces violence, denote seasons, cleans air, creates economic opportunities, offers shelter, saves and cleans water, absorbs harmful UV rays, increases property value, self-repairs, provides habitat for wildlife, lasts hundreds of years, and that everybody loves. A pretty difficult design challenge. Now, of course, that's a tree. And what do we do with that? Well, we cut it down and write on it, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but that is shamelessly stolen from um, a presentation by William McDonough that's on the TED.com uh, webpage. Um, and he of designed the, uh, along with his um, uh, co-author, uh, Braungart, um, designed uh, the, the cradle to cradle design system, which actually breaks down um, design into the parts per million and it's one it's a really interesting book to read if you haven't read it i can't i don't have time to go into the full details of it now but do have a look at it and the dura book um that they printed the original copies on um is made of a recycled permanently recyclable um polymer plastic hence the girl reading it in the bath because it's waterproof so the mainstream economic concept has been about commodification and commodification is about taking something that is unsaleable, like water, um, ignoring its importance, its origin or its rarity and commodifying it into something we buy. So we've done it with water, which I believe is a basic human right. Um, and we've even done it with elephants. And I'm not talking um, at this stage about illegal poaching for the demand for ivory in the Far East. I'm actually talking about, for example, Jay-Z's elephant leather 
um, Nike high tops that he's had designed by a firm called Brooklyn Zoo. And if you think Beyonce didn't bother with that as well, then here is her version. And all of them use or commodify rare leathers. And that's what these institutions do. They teach us to understand um, the value of nothing, but accept that something should be um, expensive or inexpensive. So, for example, we don't value the ostrich that this leather has actually come from or care about it, but we value or add it adds value to the price of the actual item. So that's that commodification where it's irrespective of its origin or its actual value in nature. It's only um, um, respective of how it adds value to a product by making it look unique and interesting. Um, so this is, whilst this is quite an extreme example, this is what has happened with this system. And um, because we're 60 years into it, it's got um, a little bit ridiculous where we are stripping the earth of its most vital of commodities just to add a few bucks to the selling price of an item. Um, the other thing that this does, uh, this system does is add ridiculous amounts of choice. Um, so scrolling down um, as we talk about this is Zara's uh, seasons or this season's availability of T-shirts um, um, in their menswear section. Um, there are 126 options uh, for T-shirts. Do we really need that many? Um, and if I go on to ASOS, there were over 2,600 men's T-shirts um, available to us. That ridiculous amount of choices shows the ridiculousness of this system and how spoiled we've been in terms of um, what choices we can make. And it also kind of shows why we all run around being quite, quite so stressed out all the time. I mean, do I really want to have to choose from 126 options just to get a bloody T-shirt? Um, it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable system. So yeah, that's what we do. We cut down these trees, these valuable resources, and we create paper and then we write, so help save trees on it. There's an ultimate irony to this system that is untenable. So has this system done anything good for us? Well, yes, in a way it has. We've become a lot more efficient and a lot better at actually making things. So if we look at materials intensity, the amount of materials we need to convert something into a valuable commodity, we've got much more efficient at creating stuff. And what this has done is dematerialize. So a number of years ago, we would have made this very large PC, used a lot of materials to do it. It wouldn't have been very efficient. Now we've dematerialized down to a tiny little laptop that is much more resource efficient. Um, and much more powerful. So the productivity um, that we've created from that is enormous. The big problem with this efficiency, however, is in this in, in economic paradigm, what that's done is in reduce costs and access, therefore, to the market for more and more people. So whilst we've become much better at making things, we've also become much better at consuming and buying stuff. So you can see that our global extraction has absolutely skyrocketed. The growth has been unbelievable. And you can see 418 million tonnes of um, paper and cotton used worldwide every year. And you can also see the hallmark of our enormous um, regeneration of uh, cities in the Far East and other countries where demand for cement has gone absolutely through um, the roof. And of course, fossil fuels provide the energy for all of this um, dim, uh, grow or provide the energy for all of this growth. So largely what's happened with industries is that we've automated um, and that's what's made us more efficient with our resources and faster and more productive with what we're creating. Um, but fashion is a bit of an exception with that because whilst we have created a lot of useful machines it's actually still very labour intense. It still requires people and their dexterity and their skills in order to produce um, the clothing on the sorts of economy of scale, economies of scale that these um, low-cost, high-consumption companies need in fast fashion. So what we've done, therefore, is drive down the cost of labour and farm it out to um, other countries where we can exploit that labour for incredibly low prices. And um, this illustrates, this is a photo by a, a Canadian called Edward Beninsky, who studies um, 
the manufactured landscapes and looks at this phenomenon of um, the system that we've uh, created and the kind of images behind this huge supply chain system that we've generated for all commodities, not just fashion. Um, and the net effects of that have been driving down these wages and using people as machines um, rather than um, creating these uh, sort of automation in fashion. And the results of that have been things like Rana Plaza, and we've seen that um, quite a, a lot in other presentations, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But this is called the Embrace, um, a, a shocking picture um, that, you know, bounced around the world, illustrating the plight of Bangladeshi, uh, low, very low-paid Bangladeshi garment workers at the time. And if we go to the War on Wants website, um, waronwant.org, um, they are still experiencing, also have still discovered garment workers in the same factories, still working up to 80 hour weeks, despite, despite the fact that the Bangladeshi government declared that as illegal, working for Asda, Tesco and Primark two years later, despite the fact that all of these companies created the illusion that they were doing something about it. So essentially, what has this created in terms of this institution? Well, actually, um, it's created temporary happiness because uh, um, it's all about just the purchase itself. The clothing is low quality. Um, it's throwaway. It's a duplicated artifact that makes us all look like clones. And uh, the worst thing about it in terms of fashion is it's conformist. And I was thinking that fashion was always about anti-conformity and making statements and um, being interesting. Um, so it creates these very boring lines of clothing, very plain, very standardised, um, very cheap, um, and it makes us into these uh, these clones, um, which isn't very exciting for fashion or its development or design or anything else. Um, and the big thing, and all it focuses on is newness, and we know, as we've discussed, that newness is what's creating this huge demand for fibre production, yarn creation, and um, the, the low-cost production of the garment itself. And you can see that the CO2 emissions that we've discussed in this presentation are all up front. It's all for this constant newness that we demand. So if we actually stopped buying um, constantly new stuff in very short life cycles, we would have an enormous reduction on the impact of what the garment or fashion industry um, creates in terms of environmental damage. And the point is that um, when I get to the end of my life, just before the bus hits me in the face, what is going to flash before my eyes? Is it going to be the trip that I, where I got some wonderful five minute piece of uh, happiness where I went to H&M and got a bit of a bargain? Um, or is it going to be the, uh, the, the time that I went with my mum and dad to Africa on holiday? OK, or is it going to be the family dog, Millie? You know, I'm, these are the things that I want to remember, not getting a bargain in H&M. And my point here is that this system actually doesn't make us very happy at all. Um, the UK is a pretty miserable nation, um, and so are many of the other ones involved in this mass consumption model. Um, the countries that avoid that, like Sweden, quite a lot, Denmark, various others that aren't centred around this consumption model, that buy less... Um, focus on going outdoors, all those sorts of things, Australia included, are in fact a lot more happy when asked. And it's because it's family and friends and our social time that makes us happy, not buying. And of course, 70% of the UK's leisure time is about um, uh, shopping. It's our favourite leisure activity. And what an enormous shame that is. So what can we really do? Well, um, what we need to be able to do is reduce the resource impacts of um, this newness that we constantly demand. So what I would ask you to do is extend the useful life of your clothing, repair it, customise it, um, wear it for longer, buy pieces that are more timeless and less transient and trendy. Um, try to uh, reduce the environmental, environmental impacts of laundry, so um, wash cold. Um, it really does work. I do it all the time and it makes absolutely no difference to the cleanliness of my clothes whatsoever unless they are, you know, unless I really have chopped coffee down my front. Um, 
increase the supply and demand for pre-owned clothing. This is getting more and more trendy with vintage and it's really useful um, for reducing this constant demand for newness and it's you guys that can make it cool. And avoid dumping clothes in terms of throwing them directly out. Please, please, please get the get your curbside um, you know, uh, bags of clothes, get them to a clothing bank, get them to your local charity shop. Just don't dump them for incineration or for um, going to landfill. So there's a little bit about um, those actions that you can take, which I'll uh, leave you um, to look at. So if it has to be new, buy sustainable, pay fair, look for fair trade, support the brands that are changing this system and avoid that fast fashion fix, because that is what will disrupt um, the current market paradigm and the current institution that we're in. And if you need that quick fashion fix, buy again or borrow it from your friends. Um, reuse, upcycle, um, have some fun remaking or customising your old stuff. And if it has been in your wardrobe and you are not utilising it, not wearing it, remember that despite the fact that it might have cost you a lot of money, it could be somebody else's treasure. So get it out there, get it back into a charity shop, get somebody else buying secondhand rather than buying new. And so what I'm gonna finish with is that I really believe we can fix this system based on the fact that we have done this many times. Um, this is a model of um, what we call long wave technical disruptions um, that it is a theory by a lady called uh, Carlotta Perez, and she's um, a big economic expert um, that uh, advises the UN and various other governments on economic policy. And she suggests that every so often, um, huge technical waves that are pervasive through all industries come along that disrupt the market and cause us to have to redesign this system. And the last one we had was the information and te uh, telecommunications revolution that began in 1971. We've just experienced a huge installation and deployment um, period. Um, and if we can think about for a moment all the changes that that has constituted, you can see that um, it's required our retraining, our redesign of businesses. If we look at the recent effects of social media, every business has had to react to that and redesign their business models. And whilst that's happening, what tends to happen is that there is a collapse and readjustment. And the hallmark of that is um, uh, recessions. And so I believe the recessions that we are having at the moment are to do with the fact that we know, we are well aware that we need to redesign this system and recreate it efficiently. And um, so I believe that the, the next stage or the next big installation period we're going to have is to do with the state sustainability, because it has to be. It has to be that we reduce the damage that we are doing to the place that we live. Um, and it has to be that we restore our balance between what we are doing as human beings and our ecology, our effects on our environment and the, the animals and natural world um, around us. And I believe that that shift in market paradigm will change um, the way um, that, that this system works um, and it will become much more equitable, ethical um, um, in its nature, again, because it, it has to we have to start consuming on the level that we are consuming. And I believe that will make us a lot happier, a lot less stressed, um, and much richer in many of the things that make us happy rather than just financial gain. Thank you very much.